Welcome, everybody. My name is Don Fisher. I'm the uh, acting principal at the college. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce the program that this uh, lecture is part of, and then I'm going to hand over to, to Zach Couture, who's the host for today. The Cecil and Ida Green uh, Visiting Professor program here at uh, UBC goes back a long way. It was founded in 1972 as a university-wide program, and the intent then, as now, is to bring uh, eminent scholars to UBC to be here for a short period of time to give a lecture, of course, on their expertise. But the idea was that always that they were doing work that had interdisciplinary and wide appeal. And as you, as you know, tonight's uh, lecture is no exception. Um, we took over, when the college was founded in 1993, we took over the program for obvious reasons. But it is a separate endowment that exists within the college. And so it will continue for as, as long as the college continues, as long as we continue, who knows, uh, which is great. Um, there have been over 200 visiting professors. The current version, uh, our guests, they come, they stay with us for a week, they give a lecture here, but uh, we uh, encourage them, and, and they do, participate in the life of the college. So there's lots of opportunity to meet, to meet residents and other faculty and so on. So that's the introduction. Welcome to those that you who are new to the college. If it's your first time, enjoy tonight and come back and see us again. Okay, Zach. Uh, thank you for being here, everyone. My name is Zach. I am a resident here at Green College. Before we begin, I would like, I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam Nation. The University of British Columbia, and by extension, Green College, are situated on the lands and waters to which the Musqueam people are the rightful and traditional stewards, and under a context of ongoing settler colonialism. In order to affirm anti-oppression and anti-racism everywhere, we must first address how we are complicit in the continuous colonial process here at UBC. I would like to ask that we recognize that decolonization is not simply a metaphor, in the immortal words of Takin Yang, but that it involves a giving back of indigenous land and life. This acknowledgement serves as a first step in our fulfillment our, to our constant responsibility to indigenous peoples and the lands to which we organize on. It is important that as we discuss the topic of empathy and anti-racism, we reflect on the close intersections and interactions between racism and settler colonialism. In order for us to lay the groundwork for bridging divides, we have to understand where we are now. And as such, it is important to actively acknowledge and confront the fact that this institution exists in the way it does now under the backdrop of the dispossession of indigenous peoples. And only from there may we begin to imagine and work towards better alternatives. With that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Terry Givens. Dr. Givens is a professor of political science at, the, at McGill University. She began her career at the University of Washington and has had leadership positions as vice provost at the University of Texas at Austin and provost of Menlo College. She was the founding director of the Center for European Studies at the University of Texas and led the faculty and staff at Menlo in developing programs for first-generation students and updating curriculum. She's a specialist in matters of politics, of comparative immigration policy and race, and has looked at cases from across Europe and the United States. Her most recent published books are Radical Empathy, Finding a Path to Bridging Racial Divides, which is, of course, one of the centerpieces for the discussion that we're about to have, and also The Roots of Racism, The Politics of White Supremacy in the U.S. and Europe. Dr. Givens was also my professor when I did my undergraduate at McGill. I took her upper year class, Transatlantic Immigration and Race Politics, and this was the first time for me, as well as for many students in that class, to be able to not only engage in discussions of the intersections of race and immigration, which are surprisingly not talked about enough in conjunction with each other, but to actually engage with critical race theory in a political science context. Now that I'm no longer her student, I can feel I can freely say this without sounding disingenuous, that you, are, you have been such a pleasure to learn from and have been an inspiration to us as your students. And it is just an absolute honor to welcome you here today to Green College. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Sorry, a little technical. <laughs> it never it fails, right? You know, you, the te it works fine when you try it the first time, and then you get the technical issues later. So I'm actually going to stand up here, and I'll turn, uh, change the slides as needed. But um, So it, first of all, thank you so much, Zach. It was really, really a pleasure to have him in that class. And I think it's funny. I've been thinking a lot about that class lately because... It was such a diverse class. I mean, we had every background. And one of the things that struck me um, was how many students came to me and said, I've never had a class where I learned any of these things about immigration in Canada and the way that it was, you know, very racist policies going back to the, um, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s and, and onward. Um, and so this issue of kind of this conflation of immigration and race is very much a part of my book um, on the roots of racism, and i am be talking about that on Friday. <laughs> um, but um, tonight, this is much more personal. Um, this book, Radical Empathy, uh, really came out of my own experiences, so I'll get into that. But I just wanted to mention, you know, Zach already talked about... Um, my background, but um, just to give a, a little sense of that. So I was a first generation college goer. Um, and so, you know, in the youngest of seven, as you'll see. Um, so being a first generation college goer at Stanford University in the mid 80s was an interesting experience from a variety of perspectives, as I'll talk about. I actually worked for six years in between uh, my years at Stanford and on to UCLA in graduate school. And as has already mentioned, I started off at University of Washington just down the road. And I went to UT Austin, Menlo College, then McGill. And so my research started out studying the radical right. And one of the reasons for that was, first of all, the radical right was in the news. There hadn't been a lot of research done, that, certainly by Americans, back in the late mid to late 90s on the radical right. And I was interested in party politics, but also anti-immigration politics in the context of party politics. And so um, studying the radical right was uh, a very interesting experience. And oh, I'll talk, don't worry, I'll talk about that in a minute. It's coming. <laughs> Don't worry, I got a lot to say about that. Um, so then, um, you know, I went on to study immigration politics in, in the EU as that began to develop. Um, and my book, Legislating Equality, focused on uh, anti-discrimination policy. And then, of course, more recently, radical empathy and the roots of racism. So that's just a quick walk through my academic career. But let's go back in time. <laughs> so here we go. Um, so this picture over here is um, me. Uh, I'm the baby being held by my mom. And that is in Spokane, Washington, not long after I was born. Um, so my father was in the military. And he is from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And my mom is from uh, originally Opelousas, Louisiana. That's why i my grandmother spoke French, so I learned French. I started learning French when I was in middle school. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my dad being in the military, the family bopped around, you know, every few years from as he was working in um, radar and strategic air command for the Air Force. And so, uh, you know, we happened to, Spokane was the, the last place we landed, and he retired in Spokane. So that's, I grew up in Spokane. But, you know, you can imagine um, Spokane in 1964, when I was born, was less than 1% black. And most of the black uh, population in Spokane at that time was from the military base. So we had friends, other black friends who were from the military. Um, but it was not, you know, a very diverse place at the time. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I try to explore is, you know, why did my parents make that decision to stay in Spokane, Washington, when, um, you know, my mom, first of all, they met in Los Angeles, because the first place my dad was stationed for in the Air Force was out, you know, right there near South Los Angeles. My mom left Louisiana when she was about 20 years old with her brother and sister to go work in Los Angeles because there's more work there. Um, and she, you know, they were both in, in many ways part of the Great Migration. So for those who don't know, the Great Migration is the movement of African Americans, mostly from the South to the North and West of the U.S., 
one of my major inspirations for this book and just life in general is Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Suns, and I strongly recommend that book if you have an interest in learning more about that history. But, um, you know, I am a product of the Great Migration. My great-grandfather and grandfather moved from Georgia to Pennsylvania. Um, my mother, as I said, moved from Los An Louisiana to Los Angeles. You know, it's, it was economic, for sure, but there was also a striving. They wanted their kids to have a better chance at education. My mother only got an eighth grade education because that's all you could get when you were in Louisiana and a black person in the 19, when she was born in 1930. You could not go past eighth grade. There was nowhere for you to go. And so she went to work. She worked for, you know, to help support her family, went on uh, to find a job in Los Angeles and met this really cute guy at a bar in Los Angeles named Roy Givens. And three months later, they got married and started having kids right away. <laughs> um, my mother was Catholic, so I was raised Catholic. My dad converted to Catholicism. So I always say there's still another memoir left that's um, called Growing Up Black and Catholic in Spokane, Washington. Um, so there's, uh, you know, if you don't, I mean, Spokane is not only not very, very much uh, a... Uh, diverse city, uh, but it's also, you know, not a lot of Catholics. Um, and so that's also an, an interesting aspect of growing up there. But um, so one of the things I started thinking about, I was, I was thinking about my background is, you know, what were, what were my parents' goals? And especially reading Isabel Wilkerson's book, it made me realize, wow, you know, you know, basically, I'm my ancestors' wildest dream. I'm a, a pro successful professor. You know, I got education, and you know, I think one of the most important things we forget about the Great Migration is that it wasn't just, like I said, about getting jobs. It was about having opportunity, not just for my parents, but for their children. And so, you know, there's this generational impact that I think about a lot, and that has, you know, definitely as I, I worked on this project, um, helped me to better understand some of the choices my parents made. Um, and we certainly got a good education growing up in Spokane. You know, it was a relatively safe place, although I've, as I've learned, you know, Spokane was a, a very breeding ground for serial killers for some reason. I don't know why, <laughs> but um, it's uh, had a few. Um, and so um, one of the other things, this, my father passed away in, in 2001 from a heart attack, unfortunately. And actually, the book opens up with that story of how we had gathered together as a family um, for his birthday. And a few weeks later, he passed away from a sudden heart attack. He was uh, 72, uh, so relatively young. Um, and, you know, we, at the time, you know, obviously we were heartbroken, but, you know, the researcher in me came out and said, well, you know, what, why? You know, how did this happen? And so I started doing research and found out that the number one reason, or sorry, one, not the number one, but one of the main, co uh, let's see, not causes, but just being an African-American male put you at high risk for heart attack and from dying from a first heart attack. And I had no idea. And, you know, I will, I'll talk a little bit more in a bit about other health-related issues that, that came up for me from this. But after he passed away, we were going through his things, and I came up across this picture. And it's a little hard to see because it's on the edge. But, um, you know, my father is the only African-American in 1962 in his NCO Academy class, non-commissioned officer. And when I saw that picture, I was just like, you know, I, it, I just felt so much of a connection to my dad because I've experienced the same thing. You know, when I was in school at Stanford, when, you know, as a leader in higher ed, you know, I'm often the only black person in the room. And, um, and so, you know, and he would always tell us, you know, you, you know, first of all, and many of you, I'm sure, have heard this before. You have to work twice as hard to get half the credit. I hear you handle and shaking his head. <laughs> and but also, you know, he really emphasized um, that we had to be, you know, upright. And you know, when we went to church, we all had to dress to the nines and and you know, be quiet and and respectful. And you know, you can imagine we took up an entire pew, nine people. Um, but 
I, you know, I talk a bit about the whole, this whole issue of respectability and the pressure that puts on people. You know, you can't just, you know, be yourself. You have to always, you know, act a certain way, be a certain way to counteract the negative stereotypes that you're dealing with on a regular basis. And so, you know, this was another thing I really thought about. And that's a gratuitous picture of me at Stanford running track because I, I ran track my first two years. And my, my claim to fame there is I got to compete against Jackie Joyner when she was at UCLA. So <laughs> way back in the day, um, like 1984, right before, she, and she, she totally decimated the Stanford team just by herself because she was a heptathlete. She did every event. But anyway, I, I can say I jumped in the same long jump pit as Jackie Joyner. <laughs> But anyway, but I mean, you know, Stanford was a huge, had a huge impact on me, and I've got lots of stories about that as well. But, um, you know, I, I want to focus a little bit more on, um, you know, the, the journey and about writing this book. So as I was thinking about what was going on in the world, and this, you know, I started thinking about this book around 2018, well, after Trump. Uh, seeing how the, the divides were getting more and more difficult to bridge in society. And, you know, it made me start thinking, well, maybe I need to kind of look at myself and my own biases. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, this whole idea of respectability and so on. And growing up in Spokane, my parents, you know, there were certain other black people they did not want us to hang out with. And, you know, so they had their own biases, and those were kind of imprinted on me. And um, so later in life, I really had to work against the biases that my own parents, you know, and it was probably more class-based than anything else. But it was still just, you know, very startling to me to think about the idea that, wow, you know, even within my own family, we had this bias. And so it got me to the thinking about the idea of internalized oppression. And the way I think about internalized oppression is the sense that, um, you know, we look at society, we look at how there's all this bias against black people and people of all different kinds of backgrounds who may be, you know, quote unquote different, even though we're the global majority. Um, and, you know, you internalize that. So, you know, you, you, so you take on those biases in a way that um, may impact the way you interact with other black people and so on. So I had to confront myself first and say, whoa, you know, I grew up with these kinds of biases. And so I need to think about how I personally need to move past those biases or at least be conscious of them. And so as I was thinking this through, that's how I came up with the um, what I call the, the six steps to, to radical empathy. I think go to, so what is radical empathy? So for me, it was a process really of thinking about my identity, um, who I am, um, but you know, storytelling, thinking about my family stories, um, thinking about my life experiences and how all of those things come together to create who I am today. And um, one of the things that was most important is vulnerability. And if you read the book, I talk about vulnerability. Well, I'm, I'm modeling vulnerability because I get, you know, into the nitty gritty of, you know, some of the issues that my family faced, um, that I faced trying to reconcile, um, you know, this idea of kind of responsibility, politics, and so on. And um, so I really firmly believe that if we're going to bridge divides, we have to start with ourselves and look inside and say, what are some of the ways that I am dealing with bias? And then the second step is becoming grounded in who you are. I call my 20s my years of cognitive dissonance <laughs> because I came out of Stanford and, you know, here I have this great degree and, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get jobs in the nonprofit sector, hadn't decided yet to go back to graduate school. And I felt like I had this um, recording going on in my head that was just, you know, it was you know, a lot of negative feedback and, you know, all kinds of things that were going on that were making me feel kind of disconnected with my success. <laughs> and so I, you know, started thinking about it and it was by my, the time, 
but also, you know, it wasn't just the success component. It was the who am I? Um, people try to put you in boxes, right? And so they see your external features and they want to say, okay, oh, well, you know, Terry, you're black, so you must study U.S. and you're American. You must study U.S. race and politics. Like, well, no, I'm very interested in Europe, <laughs> you know? I, I, I speak French. I, I eventually learned German. You know, I, I want to study these issues in Europe because that's where my interests lie. But people always want to put you in a box. And so... You know, I had to become grounded in who I am and be accepting of the fact, yeah, I'm not going to do what everybody thinks I should do or, you know, uh, says I should do because of my identity. And so, but that's really hard to do, right? And so being grounded in who I am, you know, helped me to get that past that constant refrain I felt like I was hearing in my head, oh, you should do this, or you should talk this way, or you should act this way, or you should only listen to this kind of music, you know. There's all these things when you're young that kind of, you know, play uh, out in your head about the ways you should be. And so it took me a long time, to, until my late 20s, to really get comfortable with who I am. And, you know, it really had an impact on my ability to have more authentic relationships. Um, and, you know, luckily it was right around that time that my soon-to-be husband and I got together. We'd known each other at Stanford, but we'd been out for five years before we were actually started dating. And, you know, I was still kind of in the process of kind of becoming grounded in who I was. But, um, you know, it was really important for me to make that connection and say, I want somebody who loves me for who I am. And I always say that um, you want to be a, in a relationship where you both are better people when you're together. And, you know, that was certainly the case um, with my now husband. Um, he puts up with a lot for me, <laughs> including living in Montreal while he's still in California. We, we make it work. But, um, you know, it's... It, Having somebody who was willing to support me in my career and, and all the things that I do, as well as being supportive of him and you know his career as an engineer, uh, was important. But I, I, ha I would have had a hard time doing that um, if I hadn't gone through this process of, of being more grounded in who I am. Um, and so I think that's really important. And opening yourself to the experience of, of others, um, and this is something we all need to be doing these days, um, is, you know, when you're more grounded in who you are, then I really believe it's easier to be open to others' experiences because part of it is, you know, do you become defensive, you know, when people are, you know, trying to help you understand their stories? Um, do you really listen? Um, and are you willing to, you know, basically agree to disagree at times? <laughs> Um, and, you know, the pra practicing empathy, of course, is the important component of this. And I still have to practice empathy every damn day. <laughs> I was doing it today. Um, you know, I had a call from my son's counselor that he missed a session. He's, and he's 20 years old and at, in college at Concordia in Montreal. And I was just like, oh, my God, he's got ADHD. You know, he he's, has trouble, you know, kind of keeping up with things. And so I was like, okay. It's time for me to practice really radical empathy <laughs> because I have to, you know, imagine what it's like. I have no idea what it's like for him to have ADHD, right? And it's not something, you know, he's not a bad kid. He's a wonderful child, and what he's, he's more than a child now, obviously. But, you know, he's really um, open-hearted, and, and, but, you know, he misses things, right? He doesn't make it to class sometimes, et cetera. And he loves gaming, which doesn't help. And so, you know, every single day I'm practicing empathy. But the radical part of it is taking action. And I want to mention, because this is really important in the issues we're dealing with today, is empathy is not absolution. And empathy is not absolution, meaning because you empathize with somebody doesn't mean you agree with them. It doesn't mean you're taking on the exact same position that they are taking on a particular issue. It means that you can put yourself in their shoes and may try to understand why are they taking the position that they are. You don't have to take on that position in order to do that. But you can, um, you can uh, have empathy 
try to have some, you know, you may completely disagree with the person and not like what they are saying, for sure. That happens to me all the time. But I am trying at least to say, what it is it like to be in that person's position? And it's not always going to work in terms of, uh, you know, being able to bridge those divides. But the, the trick is we don't try enough. <laughs> Um, because there are some divides that aren't so difficult to, to get past. And so taking action is critical. Because I remember when the whole Black Lives Matter thing was going on, and at the time I was living in Menlo Park, California, and all my neighbors um, had their Black Lives Matter signs out, and you know we had our little march in our neighborhood street. But I was like, okay, so what are you doing? I mean... There's maybe three black families in our entire, you know, large neighborhood. And, you know, what are you doing to make it our, our own neighborhood more accessible? What are you doing to welcome and, and you know, support people who are dealing with uh, issues in our community? Um, you know, there's so many ways to go beyond having the sign in your front yard and saying, I'm actually going to do something about this. Um, and so, actually... At the end of every chapter of the book, it has ways you can take action, but I'm actually working, I just signed the contract for the next book, um, which is a follow-up, which will focus on how are people taking positive action um, in, using empathy. And so the next book will really focus in on some specific uh, folks and organizations. And, you know, and um, I can use my own example. I will be writing about it in the book. So um, in... 2020, um, in September of 2020, McGill's principal at the time um, announced a new initiative that was going to address uh, anti-black racism at McGill. And the reality at the time was that McGill had 12 black faculty out of 1,700. And so my friend Deborah Thompson, who had just started at McGill, um, gave me, a, or well, actually, she posted on Facebook, um, something and, and, uh, you know, about, uh, them having an opening. And I jokingly said, Oh, well, maybe I'll be interested if, uh, cause it was right before the election. Um, Biden doesn't win. Maybe I will be heading north of Canada as, you know, it's a typical thing we Americans say. But, um, I actually, you know, contacted her and said, Well, you know, my boys are going to be out of high school and, you know, I could theoretically come and work at McGill. And um, so she sent me the information about the strategy and I got in touch with the folks in poli sci and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm interested. So we went through the whole process um, and, uh, you know, I ended up taking the position in the summer of 2021, um, right in the middle of COVID, which was interesting. I won't go into that. But in any case, I did start working with the provost's office right away on helping to not just to recruit black faculty, but to help with uh, student issues, um, to work on not just recruitment, but retention, which is still, I'm sure, and we all know this is an ongoing <laughs> issue. Um, and, but also to start working on the culture of McGill. So I have given talks like this about radical empathy all over the McGill campus. Um, you know, I've worked with various groups, including the provost office leadership team. Um, and in the last year, I, I uh, in July, I stepped down to, from the provost office to work in the faculty of arts because my firm belief is, yes, it starts, it can start at the top and, you know, the provost office worked to set up the, um, you know, uh, recruitments and positions for black faculty all across campus, not just the Faculty of Arts. But I firmly believe that, it, you know, we can't always rely on the people who are oppressed to do the work, <laughs> right? Um, I talk about uh, emotional labor. I mean, I'm kind of, you know, this is probably one of the last talks on radical empathy I'll do for a while because I need a break. I've done like 60 talks in two and a half years, and that includes workshops and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, partly what we have to remember is that we need our, all of our leaders, whether they're department chairs, uh, faculty more generally, um, deans, et cetera, to take this stuff on. It's not enough to say, okay, we're going to hire these black faculty or whoever it may be, and then just sit back and see what happens. We have, to, you know, you have to change the culture. And so I really feel like my work at the faculty of, level of the Faculty of Arts is also critical 
to um, you know making sure that this work continues, that we don't just turn around and, and watch all that we've done you know slip away. So in any case, um, you know that process of creating change and building trust, you know, has to be able to go beyond me, <laughs> um, at, especially in, in this case at McGill, because. You know, if people believe in what, what they're doing, then it should never ever rely on any one person. It should be. That's why I'm talking about how this has to become part of the culture, um, in that specific case for sure. And so, um, this process of creating change and building trust is not easy. <laughs> um, I can tell you, you know, changing the culture ha has meant. Um, Situations where people who were very, you know, not necessarily on the faculty, but certainly on the staff side have had to move on um, because they weren't, uh, you know, supportive of what was happening or, you know, even undermining what was happening. But I also see, you know, that that change is happening for sure. And building trust is an important component of it because as you go through that process of change, you want people to believe that it's really happening, right? And so um, building trust is a major component as we, we go forward. Um, so anyway, I just have a, a couple uh, of more things I'll talk about. So one thing I, I tell people, if you want to get started in the, on this process, is learn, what, what are you doing to, to tell your story? And it means, and I'm not saying tell your story to everybody. You know, people say, well, how, how can I be vulnerable? But it's not necessarily about being vulnerable with others. I, I'm being vulnerable all over the place, but um, it's about being vulnerable with yourself. And it means, what is your family story? You know, what community, I mean, where I grew up has had a huge impact on who I am as a person, you know? I, I, I still love, it's so funny, I was walking through the, the, um, the uh, trees behind the, um, uh, what's the name of the building? Cho Choi building. Oh my God, I love that area behind the Choi building because I start walking through it and I'm back in my days growing up and we used to go camping and so on. So, you know, thinking about what are the things that I really, um, you know, see not only as, you know, part of my family story, but what are the things that, you know, kind of have intrinsic value? For me, and you know, being in the outdoors, I love. I went down to the beach yesterday, and you know, the, the walking up the stairs wasn't so great for my knee, but <laughs> um, but you know, I really, really love being in nature. That is something I know about me because of the way I was raised. My dad loved camping, which is you know, if you know, I mean. It's not when I. It's funny when my husband and I take our boys to national parks and things. We're one of the few black families there, which is sad. But there's a great movement called Outdoor Afro, run by a friend of mine, that is working with big companies to try and make the outdoors more accessible to all. Um, but in any case, you know, community. You know, what kind of education did you have? You know, did you were you in a schools that were diverse or not? Um, health. I want to come back to health. For a few minutes here because I mentioned how my father passed away from a heart attack and you know one of the risk factors was just being a black male well if you've been paying attention to news especially this is more a US phenomenon but um, you know that I was listening to a news story on National Public Radio one day as I was driving around and they're talking about this horrible statistic that it doesn't matter your education level or class level. If you're an African-American woman in the United States, um, your risk of uh, poor maternal and fetal health outcomes is, is higher than almost any other, other group. And I was just stunned by that statistic. And, um, you know, first of all, you know, learning at just being black means you have higher risk of heart disease. Being a black woman, regardless of how much education, I mean, there's some great examples out there. Serena Williams almost died when she was having her child because they didn't believe her. Um, and actually, if you're interested, I'm writing a blog on Medium these days about my own health journey because I've been having issues with my back and so on as I get older. Anyway, it's a long story, but I mean, just that our healthcare systems don't believe black women um, are in pain. They don't want to give pain medication. Um, they don't believe them when they're having you know, issues with their uh, um, 
pregnancies. Uh, they don't take care of black children the same way as they do white children. I mean, there's all these, you know, and so this all comes down to systemic racism, right? Is I was horrified about uh, a study that found that over 50% of medical students in the U.S. believe that black people don't feel pain because they have thicker skin. <laughs> they have thicker skin. I mean, I had a doctor once who's like, oh, I'm not worried about you having any issues with your bones because we know black people have stronger bones. <laughs> I'm just like, really? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I still monitor these things. But um, there's all these beliefs out there because of systemic racism that influence the way we get health care, that, in, you know, forget about education and jobs and so on, um, just basic health care, just basic needs. Um, so anyway, um, I won't jump into, if you want to talk about love and marriage more, I'm happy to, but I mean, the, you know, I, want to, I don't want to drag on to, oh, yes, we're already getting uh, along in time, so I want to make sure I wrap up and open this up to discussion, but you know, relationships are also very important, and I'm actually um, in the process of not only you know, trying to um, make sure I'm staying healthy on the physical side, but also on the mental side, and you know, a lot of that has to do with relationships. And you know, connecting with women, um, in particular in academe, who have similar experiences, and being able to share those experiences. And you know, I've done a ton of mentoring over the years, and I've written columns for Inside Higher Ed about what it's like to you know be in leadership and so on. But you know, I need support myself at times, and so I'm really trying to um, focus more on you know getting my own support as I, I deal with these um, various issues with aging and and just life and watching my family age etc so um, I think I don't have much after this and actually I'm just going to stop here with the slides and um, so I hope we can have a, a discussion <laughs> um, and Zach's going to help me um, collect questions but I'm happy to talk about anything um, from my experiences, from the book, from some of the uh, specific issues I get into, um, for example, about higher ed and what that's been like. So, And you've got a, a mic so the people online yeah. can hear. Um, so I'm not on screen for those who are coming in online, but if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand and I can or pass a the mic. Or a comment. We have one over there. Thank you so much for your talk, and I can only imagine how tired you are after 60 <laughs> presentations. Indeed. Um, you sp I have a couple of, of questions, and your work just looks so deep and rich, and thank you for it, and I look forward to reading your books. Um, you talked about taking action. I'd love to hear more about that in the classroom, in higher education, whatever it may be. I, I just tried and failed to talk to my students about Israel and Gaza just to give them a space to talk about it, and it was radio silence. So I'm just curious about. Yeah, and so in that kind of a situation, I, there's, you know, there's a lot of fear out there right now. And people are afraid of saying the wrong thing because they're going to get jumped on. Um, and so as Zach can tell you, what I did in my class, because right, I knew we were dealing with a very contentious topic, right? And so I, right from the get-go, I said, okay, class, we're going to work together on the rules of engagement. And so if, I'm happy to share that document with you if you're interested. But we came up, I, I wanted the students to be involved in helping us to decide how are we going to create a respectful space. And, and that way you get them thinking about it right from the beginning. And um, then the, the next step was, is to give students different opportunities. So not only were people um, able to talk in class, but they also had an online discussion forum, and then we had, they could send something directly to me. So, because I, you know, when you had a class of 80 students, there was no way everybody was going to get a chance to talk. So this way, you have to give them multiple opportunities to be able to share their opinions. And then, um, but also, you know, kind of model uh, vulnerability in the classroom. And, you know, if you stand, you know, I, I don't know how to deal with the Israel-Gaza situation. I have friends who are Palestinians. I have friends who are Jewish from Israel, who have family members in Israel. Um, and so, you know, sometimes... You know, 
you know, it's not that I'm being, if, and I'm certainly not being silent in the sense that I am reaching out to all of my friends who are you know, struggling. And not just that, I have a friend, a close colleague whose family was in Sudan. Um, you know, I have a colleague who's been working closely in Ukraine. I mean, there's all these different things going on at the same time. And so, you know, I'm dealing more directly with my friends rather, you know, and you're not required to say something on social media. <laughs> You know, um, social media is there, but not everybody's on it. And you're not required to say something there. And it's really more important to be authentic in how we deal with this. And so for me, that means talking directly to my friends, you know, going and giving them a hug when, you know, and, you know, because we can't, um, we, you don't want to be afraid to speak up, but you also want to make sure what you're doing, because I don't know enough about the, you know, the history, I'm learning about the history, this is not my area of research, or, but you know, I, I lived through a lot of what happened in the, the 70s and, and so on. So anyway, I, I, I think I learned early, over half, many years of teaching that you have to set things up right from the beginning so that students feel like they have the, the, you know, the trust to be able to speak and not worry about being attacked. And unfortunately, there were some incidents that I didn't get to see when we were on Zoom um, for whatever reason, but the student did come to me and let me know that that was happening. And, and so, you know, you can't stop everything. But I don't know, Zach, you can speak a little bit about how you thought that class went from that perspective. Um, I don't think we ever talked about... Um, you know, oh, no, we didn't talk about but, but just more generally. Yeah, I think um, the way that class discussion usually went was, you know, it was o it kind of understood to be an open space. I think it, it was a little bit of self-selection bias in terms of who went into that class because everyone wanted to, who came in wanted to engage with anti-racism, whether it was they were a novice at kind of thinking about this or not, or they were more familiar with the concepts. But I think there was kind of a, a general you know, understanding amongst us that was cultivated and it was facilitated by discussion with Dr. Givens that, you know, there should be room for, for active respect, including in how we discuss, you know, things and, and, and contest some things that other students have said even. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it was more about how to engage the discussion itself and lead to a healthy dialogue. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of having deliberation of topics. I think we should be actively discussing things. Um, yeah. Anyway, you got another hand over there. Uh, thanks, Terry. A uh, couple of questions. One is, could you say something about uh, outreach from McGill to the Haitian community? Yes. And, and second, perhaps say something uh, more in a theoretical vein about the uh, underpinnings to the concept of radical uh, therapy. Yeah. Sorry, not therapy. Empathy. Radical empathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> I need therapy, but no. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so first question, yes. So one of the things, so we, we have a whole staff uh, that's part of the ABR strategy. So we have several people who are actively engaged in re reaching out to various communities, including the Haitian. So we have somebody who is part of the Haitian community, but we also have a couple people who are part of the uh, Caribbean community. And um, and then we have somebody whose specific job it is to reach out. We have a, a pathways program for high school students um, to help them make their way. Because uh, you know, and this is true. I've done a lot of work um, when I was in California and Texas, and, and like helping create pathways to university for students. And um, one of the most important things is getting them thinking about it early because there's so many things, like in California, it's crazy. You have to do this certain curriculum just to be considered to be admitted to the University of California system. And of course, McGill and, and other uh, universities, you have to have a certain GPA. Um, and so students don't always know these things or what, how, or how to even apply all of these things. So we have somebody whose specific job it is, I mean, it's very small scale at this point and we could do more, but at least we have this program that is reaching out to students in high school and SAGEP, which is the in-between high school and college program in Quebec. And um, we have been successful at bringing in uh, students through that program. So, 
Oh, and then the, the underpinnings of radical. So, yeah, I spend a lot of time um, in the first couple chapters, well, maybe even to the first three chapters, really, um, talking about what is empathy versus compassion um, and things like that. And so I did do a lot of research on um, what do people say about empathy. Um, and even to you know, even before I chose to use empathy as kind of the underpinnings of what I was doing, I, I did a lot of reading about it. But what I realized when I read about empathy, you know, it talks a lot about, you know, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. And, and Brene Brown is very well known for her work on vulnerability. Um, but, you know, where is that next step? <laughs> and, you know, it's great. You know, so for me, that's where the radical component came in because I was very much interested in this idea of empathy, but I was like, well, that doesn't help us stop the next murder of a black person, right? I mean, we're dealing with these kinds of issues constantly, so how do we get there? Well, we, you know, I ended up working with the Menlo Park City School District and Police Department for a year, um, you know, kind of working through these processes of how do we become more empathetic to the you know, they, police in particular, to the people they are working with. Um, how do we get to the point where we don't see, you know, that black person walking into a store as a potential, uh, you know, shoplifter or whatever it may be? Um, and so that's the kind of work I, and you know, change. So getting people to think um, beyond just, oh, I'm sorry that that happened to this person. <clears throat> you know, that's compassion to to. What if I was that person, or what if I was the parent of that person? How would I feel? Um, and then using that empathy to help dictate, you know, how can I move forward and actually, you know, help to change that? Because, you know, the, the reality is we have the power to create change, but we have to be willing to step up and do something about it. And I've been doing that throughout my career. I mean, every place I've, you know, <laughs> I, I've had to write various diversity statements like, you know, I am, first of all, I am diversity, but secondly, you know, right from the get-go, you know, every job I've been in, I, I've helped to recruit other black faculty, I've helped to mentor black faculty, I've, you know, it's just, it's just been ingrained in my career, and, and it's, it, you know, that's what taking action is, it's not just saying, okay, I, and you know, I've seen this happen, okay, I've got my job, I'm, you know, I'm doing well. I'm just going to sit back and see what, you know. No, it's it's being actively engaged. <laughs> and for me, it was just my, you know, it's kind of my natural <laughs> way of doing things. Um, but uh, it's, that doesn't come naturally to everybody. And so, you know, it's about educating people to understand you do have power. You know, we all think, oh, you know, I don't have any power to, to create change. Yes, you do. Every single one of us does. Even if it's the smallest thing as, you know, getting to know some, I mean, if you look at the statistics on how few, um, you know, many, how many, how few black friends white people have, you know, I mean, do you know somebody who is black or Asian or, you know, whatever it may be? And, you know, how do you interact with those people? Um, you know, and there's just, like I said, there's tons of examples throughout the book, but, um, you know, there's there's so many different ways to take action. And, you know, there's the big examples, like I think of Jose Andres and his World Kitchen. Um, you know, he's not sitting back and waiting for the rest of the world to, to do what they need to do. He's just going and doing it. And that's, a, you know, obviously somebody who's doing really well financially. Um, but, you know, you can look at your local community who's, you know, there's homeless people, there's people who need support, you know, you can take action there. I mean, you know, going and tutoring in a college uh, uh, access program, um, you know, taking a class that you wouldn't have taken because, you, you know, you didn't think about it before, you know. I mean, there's so many different things you can do, first of all, to learn, but also to, to actually do something that will help to create change, so. Um, before I move on to que more questions from the audience, I do want to ask you a question myself. So sure. you do, you, so you listed the three different steps to, for your approach to radical yeah. empathy. And the first four, I would say, like, in some of the ways that they're described and how I think people might first, like, upon looking at them, might kind of think of them in terms of their own individual action, you know, 
grounding their understanding of self, where they come from, um, you know, opening themselves up Can you to, into the, the yeah. to, the pers to the experiences of others. Uh -huh. But then, you know, as we get to the, the discussion of taking action and to creating, you know, building new systems of trust mm -hmm. and relationships, that becomes, mm -hmm. you know, we start to get more into this discussion of the collective, of the societal. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, how do you see the role of like the individual and the society and throughout all those steps of, um, of radical empathy? Well, you know, you, obviously we're thinking of collective action, mm -hmm. right? That can really help create change um, structural discrimination. But it starts with knowledge and knowledge is power. So if you don't believe that structural discrimination isn't happening or you can't, you know, put yourself in my shoes and see how it's impacted my, me, then it's really hard to take action, right? And that taking action means, it, you know, if you're just in a, you think about, you know, civic action, it's, you know, something as simple as voting um, or, you know, helping to support candidates who you think are pursuing the, you know, the kinds of policies you'd like to see. Um, you know, so, I mean, it, 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 it starts at the, the community local level and builds all the way up to somebody like I said, you know, I'm just because I use that example, Jose Andres, who's, you know, helping feed people around the world. Um, and so there's all these different levels of action and not everybody has the resources or means. I mean, I have a platform because I'm, you know, a well-known political scientist. I've, you know, done this work for a long time. I've been a professor for, I can't believe it's been 24 years. Um, but, you know, that's, politi that's both political and social capital that I can use. That's part of the reason I wrote this book is I have that capital to be in, you know, I'm well-respected enough that people will hopefully listen. Um, but we have to use what we have, the resources we have at hand, right? And it may mean joining a movement. It may mean... Um, you know, starting a movement, <laughs> um, you know, there, there's so many different ways that, that this can work, but, um, you know, I'm focusing in on a specific issue, which is that structural discrimination, that bridging racial divides, um, that I think, you know, there was a spark that, you know, went off in the summer of 2020, but how do we keep it going? And, you know, we, we're seeing right now retrenchment, um, which always happens um, after, you know, you have this first wave of, of change. And so that retrenchment is, uh, you know, something we have to grapple with now. Um, and, you know, it's funny because everybody's, oh, we're seeing the decline of DEI in the U.S. or EDI here in Canada. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not totally true because the way, you, the way we've created change is we now have over 50 black faculty at McGill. That's change, right? You can't go, you can't retrench on that. And so, but what needs to happen is every, it, unless every dean and department chair says, yeah, I'm going to continue to support that, you know, you, you, you could lose that progress. And so um, that's retrenchment to me, is when you haven't changed the culture enough to get people to really continue the change. And so it's an, you know, I, I feel like my generation, especially in higher ed, of you know, pe people of color in general, really are in the thick of this battle because you know it's not all, we were hired at a time when there weren't many people who looked like us in the academy. You know, we're in the position to be in leadership positions, as my colleague in the back knows well, um, and we're being asked to do this work, right? And um, like I said, it's a lot of emotional labor. Um, you know, it's not necessarily fair that those of us who are you know, in the you know, midst of the whole uh, oppression being asked to, to overturn that oppression. But you know what? It is what it is. And I have the capacity and the privilege to be able to do this work and will continue to do this work. Um, it's never ending. And, you know, it may mean focusing on different groups and so on. But we all have, that's why I say it starts with looking at yourself. What is your capacity? What can you do? And, you know, and that's going to change over time as well. Right now, if you're a student, you know, you need to focus on your education, right? Because then once you have that education, you can move on. You know, I look back when I was studying, I, and I did get involved in some things. I, it helped to start Stanford out of South Africa in 1984 or 85. <laughs> and, 
Um, but, you know, I, I made sure I got my education. You know, I went on to get my PhD. And, you know, I'm now in a position to really have an influence on my discipline, which is something, you know, it doesn't happen. So don't think you're going to change the world right away. Um, but over time, as you, you know, develop and you get educated and start um, taking, you know, the, the trick is being engaged at every step of the way, right? Pay attention to what's going on. Um, follow the news. Um, get to know people outside of your immediate social circle. Um, understand what's going on in other communities so that when you do get to that point where you have more capacity, you're able to say, I have spent all this time being engaged and now I can do something about it. Okay. Sorry, it's a long answer, but... <laughs> We had a couple of hands up. Hi. Um, I had a question that was, you answered it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess I'll kind of shift the focus a little bit. Um, there's so many terrible things happening in the world right there now. There are. Um, as always. As, always, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, you talked about entrenchment and how it seems like things are going backwards mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. um, which is actually what I wrote down. So, mm -hmm. um, But I'm wondering how you can maintain this radical empathy and you can maintain this like positive outlook when things keep happening, bad things keep happening, and people keep doing bad things and putting like things down. And how can you maintain how can you be radically empathetic without getting discouraged or without turning to hate or anger or rage when you well i do get angry and i do feel rage and i mean so I, it, those things yeah and I, I get i understand where you're what you're getting at i think a lot of times yes and no you can follow up with me but i think about you know my mom was born in 1930 my dad was born in 1928 they grew up during the depression and world war ii um you know, when I was young, you know, we were still dealing with the Cold War and the threat of nuclear war. Um, there's always something, right? And of course, race relations back then were horrible. <laughs> um, and so we can't forget that we have made progress. I, I am sitting here in front of you today because we've made progress. Um, I look at the opportunities that my boys have, and I can see that we have made progress. And you know, I hate the situation with things like climate change and so on. I mean, it's it's horrible um, because you know it's it's an existential threat. But you know, I still have hope that if we can you know mobilize even more than we are now, we have to you know, we can hopefully at least stave off some of this or, you know, we're already in the process of, we're already seeing, you know, the impacts of climate change. But um, I guess, un you know, what underlies a lot of my hope and belief in people is seeing what people are doing. Um, there's a great book, I, I was involved in a book prize last year, is How to Be a Climate Optimist. That book was extremely helpful in helping me to rethink, you know, the ways I thought about climate change. Um, and it's part of the reason I decided to write the second, you know, this follow-up to my book, because it's like, well, you know, how can we be optimistic about things like changing structural discrimination? Um, and it is in the actions that uh, you know, we're taking that are, can and will have an influence in changing our institutions. Our, you know, despite the best efforts of some of the worst folks out there, um, things are changing. That's why you're, you know, retrenchment happens because things are changing. If things weren't changing, you wouldn't have retrenchment. So keep that in mind. But um, we can't, we have to stay vigilant. But I want to get let this lovely woman help. I think there's also so much good in the world and so many good people, I think there's a lot of positive stuff. There's acceptance of so many different aspects of people that didn't used to be, and in many ways, the world is a good place and a better place. So I don't know if, it's, if, if old people are more positive and young people <laughs> see the world with more, with more challenges. 
Anyway, that was my answer to you. Yeah, there's beauty, there's art, there's love. You know, lots of good things. So I wish you all of them. Okay. So you can go ahead and it's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So I don't want you be students. Possession is nine tenths of the law. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask a question. It's not really a question, so forgive me for talking around it a little bit. So um, uh, your term radical empathy, um, it's an adjective in front of empathy. So one thing that's bothered me, and, and let me say, I, uh, in the area that I work in, empathy is always a precursor of trust. Trust is a precursor of good deliberation, uh, positive approaches to conflict and so on. So I'm 100% on board there. You go up, this is the political science part of it, you go up a few levels, not university levels, but political levels, and you're into something like competitive empathy or mm -hmm. exploitive empathy or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to put this as a question, but I wonder if you have thoughts about the mm -hmm. uh, use and abuse of empathy. Uh, Absolutely. I mean... Okay, I, I'll put it out there. Donald Trump is yes. an example of abusive empathy. He's like, I, I, I know your problems, you know. I, I, I'm the only one who can solve them. And we know that's, unfortunately, a lot of words we hear from more authoritarian, authoritarian types of leaders. And um, so, you know, it's empathy with nothing. It's not even empathy. It's, I'm, you know, it, it's using a tool to say, look, you know, I want your vote, and um, I'm going to say whatever it takes to get it, basically. But, I mean, it's not even whatever it takes. I mean, this is a very different example than almost any, you know, presidential candidate we've ever had. And so, um, but, you know, the, the classic example is Bill Clinton. I feel your pain. <laughs> you know, and I apologize. I only have U.S. examples. But, um, you know, Bill Clinton. Clinton was a very charismatic, I mean, people would talk about how, and Obama was very similar. You know, he could walk into a room and people would, you know, he, they had that charisma. And um, so I think there's something there to that idea that certain, you know, politicians have that capacity to really, I mean, and I really believe that Obama and Clinton were, you know, honest in their feeling other people's pain. Um, but they're also... Uh, political actors, and so you know that the ability only goes to certain, you know, and we we can we'll have to have a discussion because I'm really interested in this this idea of um, you know empathy of, in the political class because you know how much of it is instrumental and how much of it is about creating change, right? And I we could go on and on, but I think just a quick answer is that I do think. Um, the idea, not empathy itself, but the idea of empathy is used and abused in politics um, in a way to manipulate people and um, and to get them thinking. You know, we, you know, political psychology really gets into this. You know, how do you, you know, they, these politicians attract a certain base, um, and so, but it's also, you know, I understand your pain, but look at those evil. Um, murderers and rapists coming over the border, right? So it's, you know, it's very specific and um, not true empathy. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I think I have a slightly different spin on a theme that's been brought up a lot, I think, already, which is like, maybe some of the limitations of empathy. Uh, while I really appreciate the framing and kind of spirit of it, I think sometimes I struggle with extending empathy towards um, individuals or groups or states that I feel are expressing hateful or dangerous ideas. They're doing ideas. things, yes. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, like, both on interpersonal and, like, structural levels, how do you kind of grapple with that when mm -hmm. you feel like somebody is you know, expressing something that could lead to like really dangerous things happening and, mm -hmm. and do lead to those things, but then yeah. also that, you know, like at what point is it like, I don't know, I guess if there's like any limits to. Oh yeah, absolutely, there are yeah. limits. No, there, there are absolutely limits. I mean, you know, we're, 
you know, in my own personal life, you know, I have a brother who I don't talk to anymore because he went beyond what is my limit for what I consider something somebody can do and that I can, can, there are toxic relationships, right? And there are toxic relationships between countries, right? I mean, you know, there, that toxicity builds up to, to, you know, horrible, uh, you know, actions being taken. And so, um, you know, at the interpersonal level, there, there, you do have to create, have guardrails and um, say that this, this is a toxic person. I'm not going to stay in this relationship or, um, you know, and, and, but, you know, some people, ha- and I talk about the whole mental health issue, um, and, you know, even my own mother had mental health issues, right? And so for a long time, um, you know, I, I just had a lot of anger towards her. But once I thought through the fact that I knew that it was partly her mental health condition, plus what she lived through, um, you know, I look at African Americans from her generation. She grew up poor in a rural area. Initially, they moved to New Orleans when she was older, but, you know, she had to work to support her family. I mean, all these things that she had to live through, and even worse, that, um, you know, made her who she is. And, you know, so that gave me a sense of compassion for her. Um, and then ultimately I could try to have some empathy, but until I really thought through what did she, you know, what are the things that she lived through, right? And what were the influences on her life that made her the way she is? And, um, you know, and I can try to do the same thing with my brother, but I know that he had the same upbringing I did. (laughs) And so, you know, I don't have as much sympathy in that context and you know i can tr- i do try to empathize with him and i've tried to put myself in his place but as i said empathy is not absolution when i put myself in his shoes i'm like how could you do what you did <laughs> you know and so it's not that empathy leads to 100% understanding it's that empathy is something you know we need to do just in order first of all i mean have empathy for yourself right Um, and I'm constantly working on having empathy for myself as well, but also there are limits and, you know, I, I talk about that as well. So it's, it's not just random. Oh yeah. I'm going to have empathy for every person, no matter what they, they do. It's, um, it's more in the context of, you, you know, social relations and, um, being able to have a broader understanding of somebody who, for example, is dealing with oppression, um, and so on, so. Okay, so I saw two more questions. I do want to just continue this conversation and just also kind of ask you just about the question of who becomes a subject for empathy. Because even in the way that you've framed it in the six steps, you know, there's an aspect of opening yourself up to the experiences of others. And, you know, there's a, there's a certain degree of one when, how much does propinquity matter in that? How much does the closeness of knowing that there is another person that could be that subject for, for empathy? And you had brought up Barack Obama, for example, as you know, someone who had displayed empathy in certain cases. But you know, we were having a discussion earlier in my jurisprudence class today where my friend who is Somalian background was discussing how Barack Obama was, you know, it was during his area under his leadership that drone strikes and massive well, quantities were done I mean, onto Massive on deportations, Somalians. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, for the American body politic, you know, the realities of Somali people, not even getting into the fact of, you know, American complicity in their suffering is unknown. So there is not, there's not even a means for that, for Somali people to become, like, in, in the eyes of most Americans, a subject for, mm-hmm. for empathy. Yeah, absolutely. But that's where, you know, I emphasize, um, you know, I was very aware of what was going I you know, I mean, personally, because I'm very well read. I mean, you know, the, part of the goal of a lot of what's going on in politics today is to keep people ignorant, um, to keep people focused on issues that aren't, um, uh, you know, that are, you know, really kind of surface issues versus what's really deep and we need to have an understanding of. And so, um, you know, again, we could have, we'd have to get into a much deeper conversation about how, 
these things play out in politics. But, um, you know, to give a very brief answer is, no, and we can't have the expert, you know, I do not have the expectation that every American understands what's going on in Sudan right now, or Somalia, or even the Middle East. Um, and so, you know, what I try to do in my day-to-day -day life is be that person who tries to give, you know, give resources. And, you know, even in my, amongst my own family members, I don't have the, they, there's no way they're going to have the same level of understanding that I do because I'm reading this stuff every day. I have friends who are dealing with this stuff every day. So we have to have some empathy for the people who just don't have access. I mean, unfortunately, the news is only getting worse um, in terms of its ability to inform. And, uh, you know, we can help with that in trying to say, look, here's some sources you should be looking at. Here's, you know, or, or even talking about these things with our friends and family members. I mean, I think if those of us who have better access and knowledge were out there, you know, not to everybody, but, you know, I certainly do this with my family, with friends. And, you know, my friends always say, you know, I learn so much from, you know, the way you post things on social media and, and bring them to our attention. And, you know, if you keep everything, you know, closed to, to yourself, of course people aren't going to, to know. And not everybody is open to knowing. But um, you can't do everything, right? We, and so we have to chip away at these things and um, hope that people will you know, learn more about what's going on in these places. But yeah, I mean, certainly, this it comes back to, you know, what is the role of a politician? Um, and they have to deal with global affairs in various ways. And so I, I, you know, I can't be too judgmental because I don't have all the information. But we do know bad things happen, certainly. Even amongst presidents, we may have admiration and respect for. Um, you know, they, they are often in a situation where, uh, you know, they're dealing with war, they're dealing with things that we don't always have full information. And even if we do, these bad things happen, right? Um, so it's really almost another layer, because really I'm, I'm talking about how do we, you know, kind of undermine the, these systems of discrimination from the ground up. Um, and it really takes each and every one of us being willing to say, I'm not going to be a racist today. Questions? Okay. First of all, I want to say I love that photo of you running track at Denver. <laughs> that's just awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe that's why my knees aren't so good these days. <laughs> <laughs> you had fun when you when you were younger. I did. <laughs> um, so you've talked about radical empathy in very you know, universal terms, so something that carries across context. But you've also talked about leaving the US and moving to Canada. And I'm really curious to hear your reflections, especially being in positions of ac academic leadership, doing EDI work. And I know you've had many positions like that in the US. Like, what did you learn in coming to Canada? What are there, how, how has it been different for you? Well, some things are similar, but there's a lot of differences in terms of, uh, well, and Quebec is its own uh, case. So um, it, race is extremely complicated, and I'm only going to focus on Quebec at the moment, because you have the Haitians and people from the Caribbean, people from Africa. And so, you know, and I, I knew this coming in. I, I wasn't surprised, but um, just what does it mean to be black in Quebec? And who considers themselves black and who doesn't is something that you have to pay attention to when you're doing this work. And so I do not take for granted, you know, how somebody identifies. Um, and I also try to understand that there are differences and hierarchies uh, in, you know, different groups. And um, so that's, you know, was one of the interesting things right from the get-go. Um, but given what I've studied, I knew this would be an issue. And um, what's striking to me, you know, are things like, um, you know, that, that, you know, EDI has taken such a long time to, you know, gain ground in Canada, even though there are issues that are very similar, um, particularly because of the history of immigration, um, 
And yeah, as you know, I, I talk a lot about the conflation of immigration and race. And so, um, you know, there's this tendency in Canada to think, oh, we're not as bad as those people to the south of us. Um, but the reality is structural discrimination is everywhere and it's global. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it manifests itself, you know, obviously there's, thank, you know, thank goodness, there's not as much police violence in Canada as there is in the U.S., but it's often targeting uh, black people, um, uh, regardless of background. Um, you know, there, there's all these different ways, you know, I mean, the fact that there are only 12 black faculty at McGill <laughs> just a few years ago, um, access to higher ed, I mean, you know, there, there's still major issues with that um, for various groups. I mean, don't get me started talking about indigenous um, and access to higher education. That's a whole other, you know, very topical issue. Um, but I guess, you know, one of the things that struck me is that Canada is in a, in a much more open process of reconciliation when it comes to indigenous than the U.S. is. The U.S. is just not grappling with its history from that perspective. But the, because of things like the civil rights movement and so on, we're, I would say, you know, there's been a lot, you know, we have things like, you know, HBCUs are on the rise now because, you know, their resources. Um, and we don't have similar ways for different groups to have access as like we do um, in the US so um, so it's just you know it's it means I've taken often a different approach but it, it that's why I think the radical empathy approach translates very well here because it's not necessarily I mean I know I talk about bridging racial divides but it goes beyond that and I'd say, besides indigenous, one of the biggest issues I see in Canada is just access for people with disabilities. Um, it is just horrible. <laughs> and uh, especially at a place like McGill, where we have, you know, the infrastructure is just not designed. Uh, and, you know, we've had the, you know, I grew, well, I didn't really grow up, but, you know, American with Disabilities Act has been around for a long time. And so that's probably the thing that surprised me the most is the lack of access and support for people with disabilities. And, um, you know, we, we're grappling with it because I, I do more broadly EDI issues now. But, um, you know, it's just it's very disappointing that that's such a big issue still. Uh, my question, I think, is about uh, being an ally. Yes. Uh, allyship, but I, I think feel that it's, it's also a critique of the notion of empathy, mm -hmm. and maybe allyship is a almost an anecdote. And I'm wondering if, when you're doing a, your research on empathy, if you came across uh, the distinction that Martin Buber makes between affinity mm -hmm. and empathy, because mm -hmm. it, 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 he's critical that that we can that we believe we can step out of our psychology, out of our experience, mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm, I'm wondering if the structural racism is, in fact, people believing they're empathetic. Mm -hmm. you know, in a couple of examples, uh, Can you bring the mic a little closer? It's a little hard to hear. This latest documentary um, stamped from the beginning. Yes, yes, yes. Where they talk about after, uh, th correct me, if the antebellum, that was like the reaction to emancipation, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so the the um, criticism, what they're suggesting, is, if you remember, is that the African-American people were so successful, mm -hmm. that was why the reaction came. That's in. right. Yeah, the destruction uh, of Black Wall Street, all of that, yeah. And so just one other example that kind of brings this to the fore. We've just passed some legislation while in regulations about supportive housing for First Nations people mm -hmm. in Canada. And it says right at the top from the federal government with all the consultation that this has to be indigenous people doing this for indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So this is what my understanding of the allyship because affinity says there's a, it's a border. This is Boober's notion, right? Mm -hmm. I can't cross that border but I can get just as close as I can 
diffusion of the horizon, whatever you want to call it, versus the empathy that says, I know what it is to be suffering or whatever you're supposed to be empathizing with. So I'm just wondering about that and allyship and whether empathy can be used in that way too. That's a really good question. And so I'll start with the idea that we often say you can't do things for us without us. So that's why I stay engaged, right? Because, but it's a learning process, right? So I need to be working with the administration to help them learn and understand how do we do this in a way that is going to actually help the people we're trying to help. And so that's why you bring in the consultation. You, you know, you, you talk to people. Um, and so, but if, if we aren't there, <laughs> How does anything happen, right? So um, it, it can't just be that we do all the work because that it doesn't, it just, it, we're, we burn out and then, you know, things, you know, don't happen. But we need allies. So I talk about a lot of, you know, I have a few sections of the book where I talk about how, you know, I came, became who I am. And it's because people, and because of the nature of higher ed, mostly white men, took a look at me and said, here's somebody who has leadership capacity. Here's somebody who we need to support. Not only support, but put in positions that can actually help to create change. So people in positions of power have to believe that I, that others, can do this work, right? And that I can be in a position to do this. You know, the American political, I mean, I've been working as a volunteer in the American Political Science Association for way too long. <laughs> but, you know, I do that work because I know I'm making a change in my discipline. And so, yes, people like me have to be involved. But people like my colleague here have to be willing to, you know, say, yes, we want Terry on this committee. Yes, we want Terry to be in, you know, this position because we know she brings a different perspective. And so I just, you know, uh, this idea of allyship is important, but it's, you know, it's, it's not just being an ally. It's, it's being a sponsor. It's saying, yes, I'm in a position of power and influence, and I'm, I see this young, uh, you know, woman or black person or brown person or whoever who, you know, I can support and help them, you know, take that next step. And so in, throughout my entire life, there have always been people who saw more in me than I saw in myself. And to me, that sponsorship, that's, you know, allyship is like, yes, I, I you know, I want to support. But no, it's like, it, that's why I continuously say it's taking action. Those guys who saw me, they said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm, I'm the dean of the faculty of arts. I'm going to, you know, give Terry the opportunity to work with some really high-level people. You know, there's a reason I became a vice provost, you know, so early in my career, and it wasn't because I was out there saying, make me a vice provost, you know. I didn't even know what I was getting into. It's because, you know, certain people, um, you know, who I connected with throughout my career said, yes, Terry would be great at that. Um, and, you know, and I have to be willing to pull people up with me. And that is another key component, um, is that, you know, <laughs> I hate to, but anyway, my former professor, Condoleezza Rice, was not known for being somebody who pulled people up after her. Um, and, you know, I, I, I sort of got to know her a little bit when I was a student at Stanford, and I saw that example, and I was just like, well, no, I want to be active, you know, yes, I'm a black woman in political science, and yes, I want to pull people up with me and after me and, and you know, ahead of me, <laughs> um, and, you know, support in any way I can, and so I need allies, but, you know, it has to go beyond just allyship. You know, what are you actually doing to help the, uh, the kid who has promise, you know, get into college? Are you supporting organizations that are supporting people from different backgrounds uh, to get ahead? Are you supporting, I mean, the nice thing about being in Canada is at least you, you guys support your education systems, unlike the U.S. 
Um, and you know, I, I'm. I think yeah. Somebody was asking me, why do you like the you know being at a Canadian university? It's like because students can afford it here. I know it's still expensive, but you know it's nothing compared to the U.S. Um, what I spent on my first son, compared, com, who went to private college in Portland, Lewis and Clark, compared to my son who's going to Concordia, is you know, there's there's just no comparison to what we paid for him versus what we're paying for my son, and that means more access. Um, and it means that, uh, you know, it, there's still issues, obviously, with access, but, um, you know, having social systems that are designed to, you know, help people and, you know, I, I just, you know, we had this ridiculous thing in the U.S. where we had this support for uh, families during COVID and then they ended it and, you know, they brought so many families out of poverty. It's like, why don't you just continue that? We have the money. Stop building one of our aircraft carriers and you could stop child poverty. <laughs> But we don't believe in that in the U.S. It's like, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. So we supported you during a huge pandemic, but we're not going to support you after. And so, sorry, I'm getting a bit far afield of your question. But um, it's about attitude, right? It's, uh, it's about the willingness to say, yes, I want to support those people over there because they are being oppressed in whatever way. And, um, and we do have the power to do that regardless of who we are. And so, you know, I... I I, you know, I just, I don't really buy into this idea of allyship be, to a certain extent because um, it's been used, it's been abused, especially in the U.S., by, you know, people for years to say, oh, but I'm an ally. It's like, yeah, but what have you done, you know? Um, and so, you know, and empathy is just, you know, it's one concept, but you don't have to have empathy to take action to a certain extent. But I want people to think about empathy because I want you to have empathy for yourself and understand who you are to make it easier for you to take that action. Sorry, I'm getting on my pulpit, but. <laughs> so I'm just gonna note that the time is 6.30, so I Can believe. Can we get one last question for the person who's doing all the behind the scenes work? <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to ask, I know like this talk has been mainly focused on empathy, so, and like, using empathy to result in like positive action. Um, so as a black person, um, how is your, what's your take on affirmative action being the cause of your success? Like how have you navigated that as a black person? Oh, I, this is something I have an answer for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I, when I was, uh, like in my, before I went back to graduate school, there was a time period where affirmative action was under discussion and all this stuff, and then, you know, I was an affirmative action baby kind of thing. And the reality is, you look at all the research, affirmative action is just opening the door, right? I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I needed affirmative action only because the gatekeepers would have kept the gate shut despite the fact that I was qualified. I mean, People always say this, like when we're recruiting people at McGill, oh, why can't we just go on merit? That's, that's the underlying issue. Why can't we just go on merit? Because you're not going to look at that woman or that black person, and especially not the black woman, if you are just allowed to go on doing things the way they've always been done. That's how McGill got to only having 12 black faculty, because they weren't looking at excellence, because they don't, you know, people, how do we recruit black faculty? You go out and you talk to black faculty. You talk to black graduate students. You know, you ask them, you know, if they'd be interested in applying. You know, I mean, too many of us are in our own little circles where we don't, you know, we 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 don't talk to people who are outside of those circles. So, you know, too many of the people and the department chairs I've talked to, they don't even know where to find black graduate students. I'm like, you go and talk to your colleagues. Even when I'm looking for black graduate students to recruit, I go and talk to my colleagues at the university that I know where they're, they're being taught. And it, you have to get out of your circle, right? So affirmative action doesn't mean anything <laughs> because all it's doing is taking the people who are already qualified and giving them access, right? And so I don't have a problem with, <laughs> you can call me affirmative action baby all you want, but guess what, you know, it's the twice as hard to get half as far issue. I, I've always known throughout my entire career that I have to be twice as good just to get the same access and the same uh, attention. And, you know, so I've worked my butt off to get where I am. Um, it's not because somebody said, oh, you know, we're going to open the door because you're a black woman. Hell no. 
when I got into Stanford, you know, I can show you my high school. I mean, I, I did everything in high school, you know, and I was a track star. I was in choir. I played the violin. I got straight A's, you know. I mean, because I, you know, my parents, you know, imbued that sense that you have to work hard just you know so i got into stanford and people still think oh how did you get into stanford oh you, because you ran track it's like hell no <laughs> i quit track after my second year it's because i had the qualifications and there are too many people with those qualifications or who don't even have the opportunity to be in a, a school where they can get the good grades because of the, the community they're in, who, you know, if we don't have these programs, they're, they're, they're just going to disappear. And so, you know, I'm fine with affirmative action. Unfortunately, it's disappearing in the US. But, um, you know, I, I do think the good news is, you know, there are enough of us, I think, that we can build on and start our, you know, this is where we have to work together and say, okay, we're going to build our own programs. We're going to make sure we're, we, ha we now have enough people in, in universities you know, who have that privilege, and we have to work together to make sure that we're passing on that privilege to those who, you know, make sure the schools are, you know, doing the work they need to do to support our kids. So, sorry. I, you guys keep getting me on my <laughs> pulpit. <laughs>